How many of you are single and still feel that it's okay to go have relations with the opposite sex? That's fornication. That's a sexual sin. Now, I'm bringing this up because I want everyone to understand none of us are guilty. Remember, when they brought uh, Mary Magdalene out to stone her because she was caught in the act of fornication, what did Jesus say to the crowd? Jesus said, let you who is without sin throw the first stone. Because we are all guilty of sin. Not all sin has the same ick factor. But you and I are just as guilty of sin as the homosexuals are. We need to deal with them the same way we deal with any other sinner. We need to pray for them. Pray for their transformation. Pray for them to have this relationship with Christ. To uh, be able to be transformed. The transformation that comes with this true relationship with Christ. You know, the, the true relationship we were talking about when we uh, talked, about, <laughs> talked about them making um, religion a, a mental illness. You know, but having a true relationship with Christ will give you that mental illness, according to them. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. But nevertheless, I have the same feeling about this that most of you do. That if, if somebody wants to be homosexual, that's totally their choice. However, I have a problem with it when they try to cram it down my throat and tell me I have to accept something that I don't agree with. Uh, just like for those of you who fornicate on a regular basis, if you're living with somebody and you're sleeping in the same bed, you're having sexual relations before you're married, you're just as guilty as the homosexual. It's still a sexual crime. It's still a sexual sin, according to God. Okay, so let's make sure we're clear on that. But when it comes to the interpretation of what the Bible says about homosexuality, for those of us who are Christian who are making the argument, because this really comes down to religion, you know, religion rules the world. And there's no way around that. Whether you agree with religion or not, whether you think it's the cause of all the problems in the world, uh, whether you believe in God or you believe in evolution or you believe in uh, fairy dust, whatever, it doesn't matter. The fact is, the fact, the boots on the ground facts are that religion rules the world. And, and there's nothing that you're going to do to change that. So the basic argument of this homosexuality is religion. Um, and even for those of you who are not religion, you still have that ick factor, uh, much like I have the ick factor, which I battle all the time. But they say that the Bible can never mean what it never meant. Now, what I mean by that is we have to find the intended meaning of the text as it's understood in its original context. What matters to us today is, is not my opinion, it's not your opinion, but God's opinion. Now, you know, universally on this subject, let me, let me give you a quote, for instance, from Dr. Walter w Winks that states in his, his booklet, Homosexuality in the Bible, where the Bible mentions homosexuality behavior all the time. It clearly condemns it. You know, you have to admit that. The issue is precisely whether the Bible's judgment is correct. Dr. Wink compares the comparison of homosexuality to the issue of slavery. slavery. He argues that the Bible condones slavery. He says that the Bible was wrong on the subject of slavery. And it includes that, he concludes that it's equally wrong on the issue of homosexuality. Well, if you're going to, if you're going to disbelieve uh, part of the Bible, you know, for me personally, and I'm going to say this again later for those folks who, you know, come to the program a little bit late. I personally, like, like most other Christians, believe that the Bible is the word of God. 
and we have to take it for what it says without interpretation. He did not give us a book of confusion. If you start from the beginning and you read all the way through it, then by the time you get to the end of Revelation, you're going to have a good understanding of who he, who and what he is, how he thinks, how he operates, um, so that when he says something, you, you may not be able to go back and remember certain passages, but you will remember um, his attitude toward things. And you'll be able to tell yourself in your own mind, you're going to, somebody's going to say something, and, and you're going to say, eh, something's not right about that. I don't think God's going to approve of that. Someone's going to say, oh, yeah, well, give me, uh, give me chapter and verse. Uh, well, you know, I don't have chapter and verse, but I know God well enough to know that that kind of garbage is not going to fly. So here's what, here's what uh, Dr. Wink says. He compares homosexuality to this issue of slavery. He argues the Bible condones slavery. Now, I couldn't disagree more strongly with that. This issue is precisely whether the Bible judgment is correct. Now, without going into an extended defense of, of biblical authority, I want to say clearly, I believe every word of the Bible to be the word of God. I believe the scriptures possess the same authority for our lives today as they um, possessed for their um, uh, first people who read it and heard it. What does the Bible intend to teach us on this subject? Well, let's take a look at the sin of Sodom. The sin of Sodom goes back in history as sodomy. Well, the Supreme Court made history. June 27, 2003, when it struck down the sodomy laws of the state of Texas in a 6-3 decision, the justices reversed course from a ruling 17 years ago that states could punish homosexuals for private consensual sex. Now, this activity is typically called sodomy because we're going to look at why it's called sodomy. There's a lot of passages that are cited on the divisiveness of homosexuality. Genesis 19 and the sin of Sodom is usually listed first. Now, Lot entertained two angels that came to the city to investigate the sin. Do you remember that? God sent two angels to, to uh, Sodom with the idea that he wanted to see for himself if the cries he was hearing from Sodom and Gomorrah were true. And if it was, he was going to destroy those cities. Do you remember uh, Abraham had the conversation with God saying, you know, if there are 30, will you destroy it for 30 if there are 30 righteous men? And God said, no, I will not. How about 10? How about 5? Remember that conversation? Well, that's when God, God's two angels were on their way to Sodom to investigate whether or not it was um, as, as God had been hearing through the prayers, through the cries of his people. Well, these angels appeared as men said before they went to bed all the men from every part of the city of Sodom both young and old surrounded the house they called to Lot where are the men who came to you tonight bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them now this is according to the NIV for such sin the Lord rained down uh, burning sulfur in Sodom and Gomorrah destroying both of them okay now is the text of condemnation of homosexuality? Well, Dr. Winks believes not. That was a case of, um, ostensibly, homosexual males' intent of humiliating strangers by treating them like women, thus demasculizing them. Dr. Wink offers no textual evidence that the men were ostensibly homosexual. His view is only conjectural. And he stands against the vast majority of interpretations across the centuries of this. Because they said clearly to Lot, send those men out so that we may know them, so that we may have, our, have sex with them. Dr. Peter Gnomes, a minister at Harvard's Memorial Church, 
and Plummer Professor of Christian Morals in Harvard College offers a different approach. He's written an extremely um, uh, controversial introduction to the Bible and its passages, The Good Book. Now, Dr. Gnomes himself is a homosexual. And he treats this passage as an attempted homosexual rape and argues that it does not contain homosexuality per se. Well, a third approach is suggested by uh, Sherwin Bailey in his, um, in his book, Homosexuality and the uh, Western Christian Tradition. Now, Dr. Bailey argues that the Hebrew word for no – K-N-O-W, not N-O, translated having sex. Now, by the New International Version, relates not to sexual activity, but hospitality. The words appear more than 943 times in the Old Testament, only 12 times in the context of sexual activity. However, 10 of these 12 times are in the book of Genesis. The, and this is going to be the context of, for the discussion going forward. So remember that because as we go through this, we have to keep everything in context. And I'm going to explain that as we go, so stick with me here. So remember this. Ten of the twelve times are in the book of Genesis. The context for for the upcoming uh, things that we're going to talk about. Now, Lot's response to the crowd offering his daughters so they can do what they like with them, makes it clear that he interpreted their desires as sexual. Now, do you remember what happened there when they said, send out the two men that we can have sex with them? And Lot said, no, instead, take my two daughters and do whatever you like with them. Just take my daughters instead. That's when the angel stepped forward and took care of the situation, if you remember the story. And hopefully, if you're a good Christian, you know that story. Now, Everett Fox's translation of Genesis includes the note, the meaning is unmistakably sexual. And Jude 7 settles the question as to whether sexual activity is meant by this text. Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. So Jude 7 actually confirms what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. It makes it very clear of why those angels were there, because of the sexual immorality and perversion. Now, it's also the case that Jewish and later Christian interpretations of the passage have historically and commonly seen in the sin in Sodom as homosexuality itself, not just attempted rape. Now, while this fact does not settle the interpretive question, it's, it's worth keeping in mind as, as we go forward with this. I want to talk about the Leviticus prohibition, because this is also very important. So stick with me on this, too. <clears throat> and I'm going to cite... On the subject of Leviticus, uh, yeah, Leviticus 18.22, because this is the, uh, far less ambiguous. It says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. Now, the Hebrew is as clear as the English version. This is exact translation. And if, if you can look it up yourself... Do not lie, this Leviticus 18.22, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. It is detestable. Now the obvious sense of the command seems to be homosexual relations are forbidden by Scripture. This is the way the text has typically been understood by Jewish and Christian interpreters across the centuries. It's the most read text still today. Because it's crystal clear. Anybody that says that the Bible is wrong because it, talked, it didn't con, um, condemn slavery the way they thought it should, that it was obviously wrong about homosexuality too. Well, see, you have to ignore all of these other scriptures in order to come up with that. 
But everybody who advocates homosexuality,